What's up everyone and welcome back to the comps channel. In the previous video I showed you the power over ethernet outdoor enclosure build I'm working on for Meshtastic. For today's video I'm going to walk you through the build process and your options for the standard build and the networked build. I hope that you'll join me as we dig into it. We're approaching a restricted area. Restricted area is one mile west. Today's video is sponsored by Rockland Technologies. With a great selection of mesh-tastic capable devices and antennas, they've been my go-to store for these and I highly recommend them. So the first thing we we'll want to do is drill a hole for the antenna mount. For this, we'll need the enclosure, a ruler, a drill, and a 5 8 drill bit. With the enclosure opened and the buckles facing to the right, the top right side is where we'll want to drill the hole for the antenna. So let's latch the door back on and flip the enclosure over. You'll notice on this side that there's these ridges. Grab your ruler and line it up with the second ridge like so. Once you have it lined up, we want to find a spot towards the top where we can drill the hole, but also leave enough room for the antenna to fit. Right about the half inch mark looks to be good, so let's grab a marker and put a mark at the half inch mark. With that marked, we're now ready to drill our hole. Line up the drill bit to our mark and start drilling. Once we have the hole drilled, we'll need to clean up these rough edges around the hole. I'm using this deburring tool I have here, but you can use a pocket knife or something similar to clean up these edges. You'll want to clean up both the outside and inside of the hole. With that cleaned up, let's grab our end connector and check the fitment by pushing it through the hole here. Grab the end connector and unscrew the nut and remove the washer and lock washer from it. Go ahead and put the end connector through the hole and put the washer, lock washer, and nut back on. Now go ahead and grab the antenna and screw that on and check that everything fits well and it looks like we're good here. If you didn't want to go the end connector route, the SMA connector I recommended will fit into the same size hole. Now that we have the antenna hole drilled, we need to drill a hole for the ethernet gland. For this, we'll drill a hole on the other end of the enclosure, and this time we'll want our hole at the third ridge here. Now let's grab our ruler and line it up to the third ridge here. For this hole, we'll want to mark it at three quarters of an inch. For this hole, we'll need a 7 8 drill bit, and as you can see here, this leaves us enough room to fit the ethernet gland. Now we can go ahead and line up the 7 8 drill bit to our mark and go ahead and drill out our hole. With the hole drilled, we can go and grab our deburring tool or knife and clean up these rough edges on both the outside and inside. Now that we have the ethernet gland hole drilled out and cleaned up, we can check fitment of the ethernet gland. We'll have this piece here on the outside of the enclosure and this other piece with the ethernet cable coming out of it and an ethernet jack on the other end, this will screw on to the piece that sits outside of the enclosure like so. And it'll look like this when it's all put together. Each type of build will have different power options for the indoor part of the build and the outdoor part that will go inside the enclosure. Let's start with the standard build power options for the indoor side of things. For the standard build with battery backup in case you lose power, We'll be using this power over ethernet UPS to do this. This device plugs into a normal wall outlet and if you lose power, it'll switch to battery backup and keep your node running so you can continue to communicate. Alternatively, if you're not worried about battery backup or perhaps you already have a UPS or some sort of other battery backup system, we can use this power over ethernet injector to send power to our device outside over an ethernet cable. So those were the power options for the inside part of the standard build. Let's go over the outdoor part of the build that will go inside the enclosure. For the standard build, there's only one recommended option and that's gonna be this power over ethernet splitter we have here. This consists of an ethernet jack, which is where we'll connect the ethernet cable from the cable gland. Then the other end is an ethernet cable which we're not concerned about since the standard build isn't connecting to the network. And the other wire is a USB-C cable to connect the USB port on the whiz block. For those of you with the older alternative whiz blocked micro USB, the splitter comes with a USB-C 
the micro USB adapter for you to use to connect to. I did want to address this comment from this viewer who mentioned the potential for interference based on his usage of one of these PoE splitters to power his Raspberry Pi and an SDR. This is definitely a concern, especially with low quality PoE splitters. But to make sure everything looked good, I grabbed my signal analyzer, set it beside the PoE splitter, and set it to scan the ISM band, which is used by MeshTastic here in the US. As you can see here, there is no interference from the PoE splitter, so we're good there. It's handy to have one of these signal analyzers around for stuff like this. I was having serious range issues when I first started using the whiz blocks where I wasn't able to reach my node from only a few streets away. I was able to use this signal analyzer to connect my whiz block to it and determine that it was not outputting any power. Luckily all it needed was a firmware fix and it wasn't a hardware issue. But this device was a big help in troubleshooting and comparing the working and non-working devices. If you'd like me to do a video on this, leave a comment below and I'll be happy to if there's enough interest in it. I'll leave an affiliate link in the video description below if you'd like one of these signal analyzers for yourself. So that covered the standard build options. Let's go ahead and move on to the networked build, starting with the indoor side of things. As I mentioned in the previous video, the Rack 13800 Ethernet module is picky on what it wants to get network connectivity with. I've had this Netgear PoE switch on the bottom for a while and tested using this, but no luck. I recently purchased this inexpensive TP-Link PoE switch on top in hopes that it would work, but no luck there either. The only PoE switch that I can confirm works is this Amcrest PoE switch that I used to use for my surveillance camera system. I'll leave an affiliate link to this in the video description below, but this switch is a bit more expensive and is probably overkill for most. My recommendation if you're going the networked build route is to just purchase the Rack 13800 and see if it works with the network equipment you already have. If your equipment does work, then you can just get the PoE injector mentioned earlier. If you are in the market for a PoE switch, however, the Amcrest one I have is confirmed to work. Now on to the outdoor side of things and our options there. The first and most available option is going to be using the Rack 13800 Ethernet module and the PoE splitter. With this you basically connect the Ethernet cable coming from the cable gland into the splitter and the two wires on the other end are where we connect the USB-C to the whiz block and the Ethernet cable to the Ethernet module. As you can see here it is a bit of a tight fit but it is possible to squeeze everything in here. The next power option is going to be the Rack 19018 PoE module. This module connects to the Rack 13800 to give it power over Ethernet capabilities and just connects to the top of it like so. Using this eliminates the need for the PoE splitter and gives a cleaner look with more room in the enclosure. After deciding on the power options, we'll be ready to determine the placing of the WizBlock mounting kit I offer and mount it to the grid plate. The WizBlock mounting kit comes with this acrylic board and the hardware to mount it to the grid plate that comes with the enclosure. You may notice this one is a bit different from the previous version and has rounded edges. It's essentially the same product, but the previous version had sharp edges that I was having to sand down by hand, so rounding the edges will help me quickly get more product out. With the Ethernet gland and antenna mount in place, we're going to figure out where we want to mount the whiz block by placing the acrylic board and lining it up with the holes on the grid plate. If you're just using the whiz block with no ethernet module, you have a bit more flexibility on placement. If you are using the ethernet module, be sure to set it on top of the acrylic board and find a spot that allows you to connect the ethernet cable from the gland. Once you've found a good spot, mark the holes with the marker. The kit will come with two larger screws that are helpful to get threaded into the holes prior to installing the mounting kit. So we're going to go ahead and screw these into the holes we marked. After screwing those into the holes, we can go ahead and unscrew them back out. We're now ready to mount the acrylic board and can remove the protective film from it. First we want to make sure we have the acrylic board oriented correctly. Since the top right hole is off center from the rest, it's possible to have the acrylic board upside down. So before we mount the board, line up the holes using the whiz block and figure out which side is the top before proceeding. Next we'll get the rest of the hardware out and place a standoff on the top of the acrylic board and secure it with a nut on the bottom. Then we'll go ahead and continue to do the same with the remaining three. Now we can place our whiz block on top and verify that the holes on the whiz block line up with the standoffs. 
Next, grab one of the larger screws, put it through the hole, and place the spacer on the screw like so. Then use your finger to hold the spacer in place, and then line it up with the hole we marked earlier. Then begin to screw that into place just enough to hold the screw upright and leave enough room for us to maneuver the board and do the same on the other side. If you have trouble doing this, removing the grid plate from the enclosure can make this part easier. After that, we can finish tightening the screws to secure the kit to the grid board. We can then mount the whiz block to the top using the remaining four screws included in the kit. Now let's go ahead and connect our Bluetooth antenna, which will be the gray one with no label here. Connect this to the BLE antenna jack on the whiz block, and then once we have that connected, we can remove the protective film from the back of the antenna and mount it in an out of the way location. Next we can go ahead and connect the cable for our external lower antenna and plug that into the lower antenna jack on the whiz block. The cable in mine is a bit long, so I'll tidy it up a bit by routing it along the edge of the grid plate here. Now we can mount the pole mount bracket to the back of the enclosure by lining up the holes like so. The enclosure comes with some mounting hardware, so we're going to use two of these screws to secure the pole mount bracket to the rear of the enclosure here. After that, the enclosure is complete and ready to be mounted outside, and we just need to run an Ethernet cable long enough to reach the node's final location. I just have the Ethernet cable connected at the moment for demonstration, and we'll cover that part later in the video. Before we install the node outside, let's go ahead and flash the latest MeshTastic firmware to the device. So let's go ahead and connect the WizBlock to a computer using a USB cable. With that connected, we're now ready to flash. Go ahead and open up a Chromium-based web browser like Google Chrome. If you're on Windows, you can use the Microsoft Edge browser. Once we have that opened, go to flasher.meshtastic.org. Then click on the Select Target Device button and scroll down and select Rack 4631. Then click on the Select Firmware Version button and select the version you want. And I'm going to go with the latest stable version. Now go and click on the Flash button. And if you look at the whiz block, there's a small button beside the USB port on it. Press this button two times quickly to go into the Firmware Update mode. It'll appear as a flash drive on your computer named RAK4631. So once we've done that and we confirmed that the flash drive is appearing, right click on the download UF2 button and then click save as and then look for the drive named rack 4631. Select that and then hit save. This will save the file to our WizBlock device and it'll flash and reboot. Once that's rebooted, we can now connect our phone to it via Bluetooth and configure it using the MeshTastic app. I've already done a video showing this process and I'll include a link to that in the video description below if you're not familiar. But I'll give a quick hint that when connecting a device that doesn't have a screen on it, you want to use the default Bluetooth pin of 123456. With the MeshTastic firmware flashed to the device, we're now ready to mount it outside. I'm mounting it to this tilt-over mast I built here for demonstration purposes, but you can mount wherever you can conveniently get an Ethernet cable run to. Ideally, the higher you can get it, the better, of course. For the final part of the build, we'll go over how to get the Ethernet cable we're running from our power device inside out to the enclosure using the Ethernet gland. These steps would be done outside, but I'm showing how to do this on my desk here so it's easier to see what I'm doing. First, we're going to feed the Ethernet cable through the nut, making sure we're entering through the rounded side like so. Next, we're going to feed the Ethernet cable through this part that tightens up to make the connection waterproof, and make sure we're entering through this end here. Then we can go ahead and feed the Ethernet cable through the hole going into the enclosure. Now we can grab the part that goes inside the enclosure with the Ethernet jack on one end and the Ethernet cable on the other. We'll connect our Ethernet cable we just fed through the hole and plug it into the Ethernet jack side of the cable gland. Then with that connected, we can go ahead and put everything together by 
screwing the parts on and tightening them up with a wrench, but be sure to not over tighten them. Next we'll grab this rubber piece and fit it over the ethernet cable like so. And then we need to carefully work this into the part of the gland here. And you may have to work it back and forth until it goes into it, but be careful not to force it in as these outer pieces can break fairly easy if you're not careful. Then once that's inside, we can tighten it up with the nut and that'll tighten up the rubber piece inside and create the waterproof connection. We're now done with our build and we can power on the indoor side of things, whether it be the PoE battery backup, PoE injector, or PoE switch. Turning these on will supply power to our device outside via the ethernet cable we ran to it. That'll do it for the PoE build video. The next video will be for those that are using the networked version of this build and we'll go over setting things up in the app, finding our IP address, and testing network connectivity. Hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please be sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already done so. And join me for more Mesh-tastic related content, including more videos in the Advanced Mesh-tastic series. Thank you all and have a good one.